呃，各位来宾你好哈，那我们接下来即将进行下午的议程，那接下来就是会有呃，接下来我们即将讨呃进行的这个议程的题目呢是 develop 呃 numerical software， 那我们先掌声欢迎一下我们这一个场次的主讲人。Hello, can you hear me? Good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Yong, is Yong Yu Chen, and I write、uh, numerical software,、uh, scientific software, engineering software, technical software, so to speak.、Uh, and this is the topic I want to share with you、uh, today. So,、uh, by saying numerical software, this is the Problems that we want to solve. Okay, so ideally, that I hope I can solve problems of all those kinds. But apparently, I don't have a big enough brain to really understand all of this.、Um, but the applications are、uh, has a broad range、um, of domains. So. We write computer code to try to understand or solve problems for them.、Um, I don't know how many of us in this room do not have a computer science degree. Who do not? That's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot. And I do not have a computer science degree <laughs> either.、Um, <clears throat> Of course, it doesn't really has anything to do with your background training, but there's a lot of problems around the globe in the universe that we will now solve with computers, and those things are fascinating, and that's why we want to write computer code. So,、um, let me try to、uh, qualify what is numerical software.、Um, I broadly categorize it into two kinds. One is the research code.、Uh, research code usually they are made for well, of course they are made for research,、uh, mostly scientific research, and we deliver them and、uh, use them as clear code, or you can say open source.、Um, but the, the point is that. If you want to use the research code for some research, you need to read the source code and change the code inside that、uh, software. There's another kind that we write the write the computer code and we sell them, but、uh, it is it is merchandisable. It is、uh, that makes money, but the user base. User bases are much smaller than the ordinary software that、uh, we have on our laptop or cell phone. Very few people uses them, and、um, this is what char characteristic I observe that these software packages are usually too expensive for any one of us to purchase. They have to be bought by a big corporate or some businesses or institutes. And, and get the license to have、um, the members of that institute use the software, and they usually control or manipulate the data or machineries that is, well, much more expensive than our annual pay. <laughs> This kind of software has a very long life cycle, usually measured by decades, and、uh, of course, a lot of this kind of software does not did not survive in the first place. But if it did. It will be very long living. Okay, so this is an example. This is、um, we are trying to solve equations that governs、uh, conservation laws, or these kind of equations are usually just referred to as conservation laws.、Um, it usually is three dimension in space,、um, and if you count the temporal dimension, it's four dimension. So when we try to articulate and、uh, describe this kind of analyze this kind of thing, we usually reduce it into 
one spatial dimension, which will result into this space time uh, grids that we can try to form the numerical methods. So it has a lot to do with mathematics. Like, uh, um, we can see this as a three-dimensional equation because we have three spatial axes. And uh, we are not really only solving one variable. We have a lot of variables. So the unknown is actually a vector. So that we have a Jacobi matrix there. And we want to solve it. We need to study the system. And this is actually um, generalized for a lot of kinds of physical processes. So you can solve, I, I solved it for solid mechanics for stress waves propagating immediate. I solved it for fluid dynamics, uh, for shock waves, very, very high speed uh, flying vehicles. It can, can be used to solve Maxwell equations because it, they are all conservation laws or, or hyperbolic partial differential, differential equations. And we need deep understandings about, about the problem, about the equations, so that we can innovate. But uh, it is not really practical to ask everyone who work on the software to understand everything. Well, if we have a research group of two or three people, yeah, that make Makes sense. But if we have a team of like 20 people and we ask everyone of us to be familiar or be able to derive all the equations, this is not really feasible. So we need some engineering. We want to simplify things. We developed the software for both science engineering technical problems, uh, but also we need an understanding of both science and software engineering, so that we can make the software. So this talk, I'd like to introduce the tools and the skills that is demanded in this enterprise to make numerical software. Python is the most important thing, and I'm uh, going to talk about high performance and uh, some lower level manage, me memory management and diagnostic things for system uh, to talk with the operating system, and uh, some more higher level engineering practices and the architectural design. And uh, I will try to conclude with how we package all those things, no matter this for open source or research code or for products. First of all, this is a PyCon, <laughs> but that's not the reason for me to include Python here, but Python is really the thing for scientific computing, as well for making the, what I call numerical software. In like uh, 1960s, 70s, it was Fortune. So everything was made with Fortune, and Fortune is still living. I would, I would claim it will never die. No, it won't die. Nowadays, uh, yeah, we all know about BLAST and LabPack. The reference implementation is still in Fortran. They continue to work, and, uh, but we do have vendors like uh, Apple um, and Intel to make high performance versions of those uh, um, interfaces. Python cannot do those heavy lifting calculations. It is too slow. But it is so convenient to drive those highly optimized computing facility. And uh, NumPy is sitting on the ground to help us to make everything run lightning fast. Let's see what is NumPy, really. It is just blocks of memories. So we, not the kernel of, the, or I should say the core of NumPy is really the n-dimensional array, which, are, which is defined uh, basically by, by these uh, Python objects. So it is living in the C part of NumPy. And uh, we have the data. is a pointer to the memory buffer that we are going to use. 
it knows the dimension. Uh, sorry, it knows the number of dimension and also the dimension and strides about how we skip in the memory buffer for indexing. Um, and a lot of flags that we can see in the NumPy source code. Well, actually in the documentation. NumPy has a wonderful documentation. You don't really need to trace into the code. And you can learn this. Aided by Python, we can write very, we can easily write code like this. We solve a simple ellip uh, elliptical equation. It is a Laplace equation. We, try, we solve for the temperature distribution by applying some boundary conditions. Uh, we can get an elliptical solution from this problem. But we, let's try using Python to get a numerical solution. This is a code. We have outer loop to test for convergence, and we have the inner loop to apply the point Jacobi uh, method to get uh, to finally get the system to converge like uh, our analytical solution. It's simple; it takes like 15 lines of code. Very good, and it is very slow in Python. It took uh, five seconds for that to converge. If we use NumPy, like in the bottom half of this version, we replace that internal uh, two-level nested loop with some fancy indexing tricks that NumPy provides us. What we got? Almost a hundred times faster runtime. It is actually very close, like uh, 1.5 to 2x. Two, two uh, slower than C version. So we usually say that by using NumPy, we are um, porting or moving the calculation from Python to C. Because these kind of things um, are wrappers to the lower level C operations in the NumPy library. So NumPy is really important and uh, the n-dimensional array really defines the multi-dimensional memory buffer or have the multi-dimensional descriptions of the memory buffer. So we use NumPy and the arrays to do the manipulation. Let's take a 2D array as an example, like matrices. So the real matrices in the conceptual model is like this. We are two-dimensional, we have a column, we have rows. But in computers, we cannot uh, order our data like that. But Newman machine model is really a contiguous memory buffer. So we laid out the data in memory linearly. So everything is conti contiguous. Uh, we can go higher dimension. It works the same way. Just uh, have different stride numbers for the elements in the arrays. This is how we can create multi-dimensional arrays in NumPy. Uh, there are many ways, actually, uh, but basically two ways. One is to stack the, uh, the 1D arrays vertically. If we stack horizontally, it will just concatenate. But if we can stack horizontally, it will add dimensions to the array. So we can create 2D arrays by using the stack, by using stacking. We can also try to just uh, uh, allocate a block of memory, like here. We got a six element array, and we change the shape, change the dimension of the array. The total number of elements needs to stay the same, but we can change how we view uh, this block of memory. Like uh, this is the original 1D version, and we, if we say that we want a two by three array, it becomes two rows and three columns. We can do the same, but ask NumPy to change the measuring of the array. So that we, call, we tell NumPy to use Fortran style column measure uh, for this 2D array. You will see it's still two by three, um, but uh, the row index and column index actually flips. Okay, so be careful about that. This is useful, especially when we 
do our everyday linear algebra operations. One thing that we also need to keep in mind with uh, NumPy array is that uh, they are memory buffers. So it's actually possible, although dangerous, to do to transfer between Python and C++ without copying anything in the buffer. Say we have like a, a thousand by a thousand elements um, in the matrix. It is actually take, uh, for floating point, double precision floating point, it takes eight megabytes. You don't really want to copy eight megabytes around when you are working between Python and C. We can actually tell the system, say, oh, this is an ND array. We just hold its life cycle and get a memory buffer to the other side of the system. Uh, we can do that from, from top down. Like we define and manage all the memory in Python and have C to access the memory that we have. Or we can do from bottom up that we manage all those data in C++ or C and have Python to just take a read and write the memory buffer but do not delocate them. This may sound uh, a little bit uh, 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 remote to people who are programming in a higher level or remote from um, those numerical applications. But this is really the everyday work we do with Python and NumPy when we are working in the numerical world. The purpose is runtime and uh, uh, reduce some, a consumption of memory. The number crunching code, that's what we call for our calculation, just need to do a lot of loops. We are processing a lot of data. And uh, that is the performance hotspots that we want to optimize and we really need to optimize. Other code that is apart from that, those uh, number crunching kernels we consider them housekeeping, and that is equally important. They are, um, they are where we can architect the software. So we form a lot of so-called architecture or software structure around those housekeeping code. Yeah, so yeah, it is a bad name. It sounds like you know, something unimportant, but those architectural thing or housekeeping work it's really important for our calculation. So our job as software developers is to keep the calculation kernel as compact, as concise as possible, and try to optimize it as much as we can by trying to organize the code very well. Okay? Yeah. And there are basically two major, major means to optimize the code. So first, First of all, before we can optimize, okay, this is the first thing, you have to time. Do not optimize before you time. You always need to understand where is the performance hotspot. So actually, in my opinion, optimization is more or less rough, more or less equal to how you time. So you know where uh, the system spends the most of time, and you try to use your creativity to try to speed up. And uh, there are several, several different kinds of time that we can measure. Uh, there are CPU time and war time. So right now, I think everyone, even on cell phone, we are in a multi-core uh, multi architecture. So you don't really have only one computing core. Um, on, in the machine. Um, the CPU time means that uh, we are timing the number of ticks that spend in the CPU cycles. And the war time means that what really happens in the real world. So, yeah. As you can see here, that um, if we have a process that we stay on the first CPU, Say it has three tasks run consecutively. 
The first take five seconds. The second is twenty seconds. The third is five seconds. So the CPU time will be the same as our war time. All the time is spent on that CPU. But if our process actually uses more than one CPU, your CPU time will be longer. It will be actually fifty seconds. So longer than the real war、uh, war clock. So this is what we need to take into account when we try to time. And uh, um, the first step usually when we try to optimize is we just time the whole system. So yeah, we use the shell we use the shell command or the executable time to do that.、Um, real means the war time, and user is the time spent in our application code. And the system time means the time spent in the operating system, so they are counted differently. That is both superficial, and、uh, a lot of time we need to make our own timer. Python provides convenient modules for us to measure the time spent in Python functions, like a time edit module, and a lower level time module that、uh, just get the time from the operating systems. They are useful, but、uh, when you go high performance, a lot of your your code is actually、um, not in Python. So you still need to go to ask those data, those information from your operating system,、um, like making those、uh, Linux timer function calls, system calls. Okay, <clears throat> then we can apply our originality. So the second. Means is that、uh, we try to take advantage of our memory hierarchy. So、um, everyone knows that we right now have a deep hierarchy of memory in our system. The fastest memory is the register in the computing a、uh, CPU core. They basically run as fast as our CPU. Then we have a level one catch, or、oh, let's say, let's go to the main memory, which act is actually a hundred times slower than our CPU, and that's why we install three or even four levels of catches in our computer. So we try to hide that latency of our memory system, and not to say when you have some access to your disk, no matter. It is real disk or、uh, solid state drive. It is of the same order of magnitude slow. So we really need to care. You care about how we access our memory or process our data. The memory layout matters probably the most of our performance. <clears throat> that's what. That's what.、Uh, why we care about the so-called spatial locality.、Um, Let's say we have a whole bunch of data here, and、um, if we, if our memory access pattern is to first read the first element, a first row, a first element in the first row, and the second read is the first element of the second row, you do not catch the second thing by your first read, so your time is spent on fetching that data. Include two catch misses, so it's at least 400 cycles. But if you access the memory consecutively, your first read, oh sorry, that's a typo. Your first read is 200. Your second read is getting data from L1 catch, so you basically are twice as fast as the first version. When your memory access is You have a lot of memory access. This will make a lot of differences. Let's see an example. Let's do a matrix vector multiplication, and、uh, the upper block is to、uh, to do a real number multipl multiplication.、Um, if we use raw major, which is lay out the memory、uh, by the By the、uh, the least in、uh, the la last index、uh, changes the fast. 
um, <coughs> the library I call um, NB.dot uh, is optimized for this row major um, layout. This is 59.2 millisecond. If we change, I change the layout to be color major, it is actually twice as slow. This is our real number calculation. And, but it's very interesting if we change um, the data type into integer, um, it becomes 69 versus 802. That's because down the next library are different. So the optimization actually differs. So integer calculation is actually slower than real number calculation. It will be even more interesting if you run this on a Mac or use Anaconda, which features Intel MKL. You'll see since this doesn't really work when we first thought. Okay, those are the means that we can optimize. And what about other uh, engineering? The most important thing is to, ma to manage the memory. Um, we mentioned about timing, but that's, not, uh, that's kind of the easy part. The more complicated part is to profile for memory. And uh, you can have all kinds of memory access patterns. So it is actually very hard to measure or to profile. So to do it, you actually need to make your own memory managers, which are the um, C APIs, um, or C++ APIs, like allocators for SDL. This is actually the last resort. You, you definitely don't want to do that, okay? Nobody wants, to, nobody likes that. But if you, may, you are making industrial grade code, like a, you, you should ship some code to your customer or your user and expect it to stay the same for like 10 years. You need this because hardware get upgraded and when you need to maintain your software, you, you cannot change how your user uses the software. You have to change on the net and this, where you, what you can do. <laughs> so, um, that is a theory, but in reality that uh, when we develop code, we actually starting from prototype, and the prototype usually is in Python. So <laughs> we actually didn't do anything like this uh, when we started the software. The thing I can say is that we need to have a conscious mind about what will happen down the road after 10 years. Keep in mind, it will come back and get you. So let's show some, some, some techniques that we can do. Um, this is some analysis, uh, so just some story talk, storytelling. Um, give us an idea that say we have a 10K by 10K matrix, we will use like 800 megabyte, right? So the aforementioned zero copy technique is really important because um, this is actually the reason that we cannot go to many dimensions for dense arrays. Say you have 100 by 100K by 100K, you don't have the computer to host that in memory anyway. Um, this is the feature provided by the operating system. When you are allocating the memory of this amount, uh, you better ask the system to get it in one page. But usually a page is like 4K, right? You don't want a 4K, it will slow down your CPU. So you want a huge page, which um, just hold everything in several pages. Another technique that I really like, uh, which is easy to do, is to have instance counter. You don't really need to touch lower level memory manager. You just you use C++. It uses simple tricks to, to know how many objects you have for certain, uh, for certain in, uh, classes. It will help a lot for you to detect uh, resource leak or memory leak. <clears throat> so, um, because we always started with Python prototype, so the thing we can do actually, because we don't start with a memory manager, the thing we can do is we try to modularize the code. Uh, that part in, in that process, we put the memory manager in each module. Okay? 
So in our application code, we actually can insert another layer, another layer of abstraction for memory management, so that we actually can know that which memory uses how much or what memory. Um, because this should be done when you modularize your code uh, from prototype uh, to your real production code. Because after you finish this modularization, that's kind of your last chance to do this. After that, it's very difficult to do this insertion. And uh, you should also design so that your system can switch between different global memory managers. There's a lot around, a lot around. Um, so you can switch them, um, and you can try to tell the differences. Some of the ad managers actually have a lot of diagnostic features, so it will help. And you should also use analyzers like Belgrin, and you should learn how Python manages the memory, because your system is built upon Python. Remember that we started with Python. So Python will actually stay in your system almost forever. Apart from those, uh, those uh, lower level techniques, we also need some higher level practices. Um, the key is we want to automate things. So I think that's the essence of engineering. We try to do things, we try to simplify things, so computers or automation will handle that for us. Among those practices, version control is the foundation. So if we don't do version control, that's nothing to say, actually. <laughs> you have to start uh, with version control. Um, so we are not going to tell, talk about version control today here. I'm almost running out of time. It's 13 minutes. I have, yeah, 10 more slides. Um, but upon version control, we uh, also need to do automation using build system. We do unit testing, and we do code review. Of course, there are other practices that are important. But those things are what can keep your system healthy from the beginning to your shipping. Make, make file, and higher level things like CMake or maybe AutoMake um, are our friends. Uh, I particularly would uh, try to remind us that make file are very good. Uh, we right now have a lot of ways to automate things. But don't forget our good old friend of GNU Mink. Um, Python disutils is also useful, but if you have like a hundred thousand lines of C++, you probably won't use CMake or something else. This is GNU Make, um, just to try to remind us how simple it is. We declare some macro and you write the uh, rules and include the recipes and you will automate things beautifully, okay? Um, and when you need to compile things, um, it's actually uh, very straightforward to start with a make file and then you consider to make migrate to CMake or something more complicated uh, or um, the disutils. And um, for numerical software, because we have to work with both Python and uh, C, C++, so usually we use uh, Google Test uh, for the lower level C++ code. There are something that, uh, oh, there's a Python library, uh, standard library unit test, and the test runner, there are more than one test runners, but I think PyTest probably is the most popular one um, and a very con convenient one. Um, different code should use different tools. Like, uh, you really should put the something that can only be tested in C++ in Google Test, like templates. Uh, you have to build a code. I mean, some errors can be detected when you build a code. And if you, if you don't have compile time checks uh, in Google Test, uh, then testing them in runtime is not really convenient, or um, it may take you more time to detect the errors in your normal build process. But some other things, especially the runtime errors, 
can be detected in, well, in runtime. So they can be either in Google test or in Python tests. In my experience, it's actually easier to do that in Python. Just wrap your code in Python. It will be very good for testing, and it actually gives you a very good opportunity to organize your code, kind of design for testing. For research code, uh, I think it's particularly beneficial to try to do your research paper in clear code so that we can do version control and code review, just like source code. So like you, you can use tools like, uh, like uh, PS tricks. So you can produce this kind of graphics or schematics by using LaTeX. This is a LaTeX source code. So you can virtually control it. Um, of course, it is not really convenient because you don't even have a GUI. Um, uh, it's not even interactive for you to produce this code. So we probably should write the Jupyter uh, plugin. <laughs> Uh, to do this, um, but it actually help you to accumulate your expertise and uh, uh, your work um, along the way. Um, you can also generate um, you can also generate more results from your calculation. So the point still, like in the beginning, it is the automation. Yeah, a lot of a lot of researchers. Um, does not have a sufficient uh, experience in computing, so that uh, they kind of learn that along the road. So I would suggest that uh, uh, if we are some scientific researchers, or if we are work with those researchers, we should we should try to install this uh, automation concept into our workflow. And this is of course very important for commercial code development. So that is the higher level thing. Um, and now I want to go into how we can design a system. The goal, well, the final goal is still high performance and uh, make everything uh, run very fast and uh, highly maintainable. Um, we can decompose the goal here into parallelization into our into to do object orientation. Of course, for smaller cases, smaller problems, we actually don't really need to go object orientation. But again, if your code base is very large, sometimes is, or I would say usually, this is un, this is unavoidable to go object orientation. And we need to make our system scriptable so that they deliver more power to the users. And uh, we should design for testing, and we should think about how to deal with I/O. If you if you have a lot of money, of course, you invest a lot in the storage. But uh, even even so, you have a very big, very fast storage. Sometimes you still need some in situ processing. So there are two things I think that are important in a lot of in micro software. The first thing is the data object, because you are just put producing and uh, processing a lot of data. So in your system, more or less, you will have a data, data object. And uh, this kind of structure kind of happen in a lot of places. So you have an initialization. Well, this is for conservation law calculation per se. Uh, but uh, similar structures happen a lot of places. You initialize your field and you try to do time marching inside your field. Then you apply boundary condition. Then if you go parallel, we usually go parallel, we synchronize the data among all those processors. Then we do back. So it's, it's a very clear pipeline. So you have this structure usually in your code. Um, so I know that in some places, when we are doing other kind of problems, uh, people are encouraged to stay away from data objects. Um, so of course, you should think about whether or not you, use, you need it. But uh, I would say you usually need it in your record software. 
Another thing is the loops, like what we saw in our uh, Laplace solver. So this is our Paul Jacobi linear vacuum method, and this is the loop that do the heavy lifting <coughs> for computing. Yeah. They are also popular, uh, they are also everywhere in the linear algebra code. Um, a lot of times this kind of looping or fancy indexing looks extremely ugly. They are usually unmaintainable. <laughs> you kind of just uh, memorize every line of the code into your head and then continue the work. So, which usually means like 500 lines or 1,000 lines are copied in your head and do the thing. And because in this kind of computing kernel, even 1% of uh, overhead means a day of computing. Yeah, so our time is actually not really important. Computing time <laughs> really matters more than us. Um, so there are a lot of difficult problems, uh, difficult uh, challenges in the system. So we really need to evolute our design. We, we cannot get everything right in the first place. If you do, I don't know what to say. I haven't even, I haven't ever experienced it left. So just get whatever you can to celebrate. Um, and to, to evolve our system, you, act, you need to insert a lot of debug code um, in, in the system. Well, they are not, um, debug code are not beautiful. So you should be careful about that. Um, but it is kind of the must. And so you should manage your system and to accommodate those debug prints. Uh, you also uh, are encouraged to use some debuggers, but to debug a uh, 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 numerical problem usually means some plots, some uh, analysis. Uh, you cannot really use debuggers to inspect an array of a thousand by a thousand. So after we got the software architect developed and verified, we should, we need to release and distribute so that users can use it. Um, in the open source uh, environment that uh, uh, we actually can just ship the code uh, on Git. So just ask people to clone it. Um, and it, it usually happens in the development phase. And, um, um, but after, after a certain period of time, we should package them so that people can, can use the code in an easier way. Because most of your users are not really developers of code. Even if they use the source code, they change your, the lines in your, your work. Um, hopefully everything can be automated. Okay. Um, so to, after you package them, you can choose to use IP. Um, if you are pure Python work, I think this is a very good choice. Um, but if you, like uh, most of the numerical software, you have a lot of C, C++, sometimes Fortran, or it's assembly, um, you should consider some other system. PyP is good, you, you can still work with it, uh, but you can use like something like a Conda, or Conda Forge, so it, uh, it is equipped with more sophisticated uh, building system. This is, this kind of completes the whole development flow. You develop something and you ship it and then you can get feedback. Well, in commercial world it is, it is um, yeah, of course it's like a commerce one-on-one, -on -one. you have to deliver to customers. But uh, in an open source environment, we should we, we also need to think about it and how to get feedback. So we we should need to use those packaging and releasing procedures so that we can complete the whole flow. So um, numerical software incorporates so much things, uh, so many things. So it usually happens among the team. Uh, so people who have software expertise should work together with so-called domain experts so that we can create better software and they really lay out the foundation that, uh, of the technology that we are using today, like your cell phone. 
Um, and uh, a very inconvenient truth is that uh, for those people who do not know how to program, like scientists, initially they want the product or the package to just work. They don't, need to, they don't want to know what happens inside. But after like one or two years, they want to change everything inside so that they can customize. They can do what they want and um, for whatever reasons. So I think we still have a long way to go uh, to where we can make really good numerical software. And uh, that is my talk today. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.